Welcome everyone. Maybe we will uh, have the land acknowledgement now and then we can begin. Thank you. We acknowledge that Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. We further acknowledge that the Toronto District School Board is hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis and the Inuit peoples. We encourage you to research the original occupants of the land where you are reside. The session you're attending is being recorded for either administrative use or to be uploaded to our YouTube channel, ESA Contemporary Art. Um, there is a Q&A function at the bottom. Please feel free to ask questions, which we will address sometime in the session. Um, all of your personal information will remain private in the recording. And as always, we wish to make this a very positive, insightful, and supportive experience. Thank you again so much for coming. And um, Stephanie, I'll leave it to you. And thank you very much, Brendan, for joining us. Of course, thank you. Uh, okay, um, hello everybody, and thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Stephanie Cristello. I am a curator and writer, originally from Toronto and now based in Chicago, Illinois. And I have Brendan Fernandez joining me, who's also based in Chicago, Illinois, but is currently quarantining in Toronto, Ontario, and is also from Toronto, Ontario. So hi, Brendan. Hey, Stephanie. So uh, nice to see you. And thank you for having me today. And thank you, everyone else for having me. ESA. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really interesting. So I actually attended um, the Etobicoke School of the Arts during during high school, and they've organized this whole conference, um, which is sort of bringing together students, but also professionals, gallerists from uh, museums and galleries in Toronto and throughout Canada and abroad. And, you know, we both have such a strong tie, I think, to our Toronto home, but found each other here in Chicago and have now worked on multiple projects over the years. And so what I was hoping we could do is figure out when we first met and what the first project we worked on was and, and kind of talk through, through some of them. Um, and then from there, really spend the time focusing on the upcoming project that we're working on that was just announced with the city of Chicago in Millennium Park called 72 Seasons, um, which I'll be curating with um, a co-curator, Ellen Hartwell Alderman, and it's a brand new commission for Brendan in the city of Chicago and may even be featuring some Toronto dancers. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. Um, but yeah, when did you first move to Chicago and when did exactly did we meet? Because I've been well, here 12 years. Yeah, I, I moved to Chicago in 2016. Before that, I was based in New York for about 15 years. But I think our paths like crossed like, you know, like here in the art world. I think I, I think there was a moment where we just had like a, a, um, a moment through Eric Shiner, a mutual friend of ours who's also an art um, an arts administrator, a curator and former director of a museum um, in Miami. And I think then when I moved to Chicago, we kind of connected, you know, I think the Canadian, uh, you know, uh, identity was like, hey, you're from Toronto. Well, there's a familiarity that brought us closer to each other. And then we were like, oh, and we're also now based in Chicago. So I think the first project that we did together was the, was the expo. Um, um, feature in Scene Magazine that then grew into, and maybe I'm being wrong right now, but I definitely think it was Scene Magazine that then led to the talk and performance at Expo. Yes. Okay. So we had done, so I was previously the editor in chief of a journal that I founded here in Chicago called The Scene, which was Chicago's International Journal for Contemporary and Modern Art. And it was issue six. So the magazine started in 2014. 15, you moved here the following year. We'd been talking about doing, or like me assigning a writer to do a, a larger feature on your work. Um, and right around when you got the 
Whitney Biennial Commission and the Graham Foundation show, we were like, okay, this is the time. Let's not do something small. Let's do um, a big cover piece. And so I've actually got it in my I was going to say, do you have one there? Because um, you, you put me on the cover. It was the first time I was a cover boy. <laughs> yeah, so this was um, a work by Brendan that was on the cover of issue six. And we had this like beautiful spread in here of that work. Um, and so I was thinking that this would be the perfect opportunity for you to just give a little overview of your practice. Sure. Um, what some of the ideas were in this, in this performance work, um, which was called the Master in Form at the Graham Foundation, actually a space for architecture um, and art and your history with ballet. I think it's also such an important part of your identity. And I think maybe why we got along so well is because I was never as far along as you were, but I wanted to be. Well, my career ended early too, but I, and Toronto is where my dance career started. Um, I'm, um, when I moved to, um, to Canada uh, as an immigrant from Kenya, um, you know, my family, um, you know, moved to Canada and I really became enriched with the arts. I don't think I would have had that opportunity in Kenya. And uh, in Toronto, um, well, I grew up in Newmarket, Ontario, but when I was going to school at York University, I was a double major in dance and visual arts. But before then I was taking class in the city, I was taking class uh, in Newmarket. So I took classes at, you know, um, Children's Dance Theater Company. I used to take classes at um, National Ballet. And, um, you know, so Toronto's dancing is really important. And when I go to Toronto, like I have a dance community. I, you know, the, 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 my, my dance family is still there and it's very easy for me to connect with them and work with them. But my practice as an artist is, is, is um, currently based between the intersections of dance and visual arts. So um, I have a dance background and I have a visual arts background. At York University, I was a dance major and a visual arts major. And I kind of have kind of taken the two now and made them into a collision, where initially I was always told you have to pick one or the other, Brendan. You can't be a dancer and you can't be an artist. And you know, I was always striving for that. I was always pushing for that. Um, and eventually in my, my um, I'm speaking of America now as a senior year, my fourth year, um, I, um, I, I got injured as a dancer, and I think you know that that, that you know that you know that rigor of being a dancer. You want to be that that you know that prima ballerina or that principal dancer. And with my injury, I just realized that okay, maybe it's true. Maybe I can't be a dancer and I can't and an artist at the same time. Oh. And so I focused. Part of me. How old were you when the injury happened? I mean, you were. Oh, uh, yeah, it was. Um, it was twenty. I mean, like twenty-two. When I, so it was when I, my 22 or 21 and I, but I was at a place where I was like, I don't want to do this anymore, or I want to do this anymore, but I can't, I'm actually physically injured, but mentally I'm, you know, I'm having a breakup with dance and physically I'm definitely having a breakup with dance. And so I kind of took my, 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 myself out of it. And I did an MFA degree at the University of Western Ontario. And I really focused then on ideas of cultural identity, my identity as a Kenyan Indian, you know, who migrated to immigrated to Canada and the notions of home identity, um, the ideas of authenticity, because people would always ask me like, well, are you more Kenyan or are you more Indian? Like what, what is your, your, what is the nature of your, yourself? And so it's really thinking about the notions of identity through something that doesn't necessarily need to be static it can be in flux it's always in change and for me you know um you know also identity is not cultural always it's for me i always identify as a punk rocker ballerina because you know in toronto i was hanging out in you know in kensington market you know going to punk rock shows you know the hardcore scene in toronto was super important and my politics still come from that scene the countercultures and so initially i started to kind of just really focus on post-colonial identity whatever that means you know because i still don't think it's post i still think we're in a colonial space and we need to decolonize that space and um as um an artist then i started to, when i moved to new york for the whitney independent study program um, a program that really steeps artists in critical theory i started to think you know, a lot more about dance. And so dancers are coming back into my life. And I was like, okay, I'm not seeing dance, but I wasn't dancing myself. And then I started making like smaller performance works. And I was kind of like, okay, this is interesting. I'm like now making performance. And then I started to meld the two. And so my work kind of deals now between the intersections of dance and visual arts, as I've mentioned. So I use a lot of like sculpture or architecture to augment, to, um, 
to challenge, to burden the body. And in that, um, I'm also asking questions about labor. I'm asking questions about value. I'm asking questions about how do we, um, you know, challenge the, the, the notions of hegemony. And in it too, I also look at hegemony power dynamics through West African masquerades. I bring back the kind of colonial voice in my work as well. So it kind of deals within those kinds of spaces. So if you want to really break down my work, it's the intersection of dance and visual arts, and I'm trying to break down power dynamics. Yeah, and it's really interesting when you're talking about, you know, the the conception that you can't be a dancer and also a visual artist. There's, yeah. I mean, I have the same thing with, with curatorial and, and my relationship to writing and exhibition making and writing as, well, you're supposed to be either an author or or a curator, if you don't have an institutional affiliation, there's like this pressure to pick one camp over the other. And there's this quote by the artist collective Art and Language that I love. Like whenever somebody would criticize their work for not being good visual art, they'd be like, well, I'm a writer. And if anybody criticized them for not writing well enough, they'd be like, well, that's, I'm an artist. You know, so you, you do kind of get away with both of these things well, by creating I, a hybrid. Definitely. Or, or people don't understand fully what you're doing. Like the dance world says, that's not dance. And then the art world is like, is it performance art? So there's like, because we have very rigid, especially with ballet, there's very specific rigidity, rigidity of what is what is ballet. And I'm like telling the dancers to like stand in place in first position and hold it for five hours. You know, they're like, yeah. Am, I am I dancing? Because again, I'm also thinking about the, the questions of like, how does one move? If you're moving, if you're not moving, are you, does that mean so is stillness still an active space that can be called dance? So it's about these like like larger questions. And then, you know, for me, I feel fulfilled that after all of this this process, like I am making dance, not with my own body, but with other bodies, which I'm very grateful who who allow me to use, but I'm also making art. So I, I am a dancer or dance maker. So I've danced in my life and I've found a way to have art in my life. And so the two come together in a kind of a, a way that, you know, works for me and it's hybrid. And within its hybridity, it does complicate and create tensions, but it also is something that that's what I like to do. I don't want to fit in a box. Like, you know, I don't want to be one thing. I want to be this queer weirdo um, who can, can trans, send to many different spaces. My fluidity allows me to be all these things. And I think that's what's really important about my, the way I make my work, but also the way I, I embody myself. Yeah, and the, and the facets of presentation for who you choose to partner with to make these performances and artworks mm -hmm. actually happen because the artwork is the happening. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's, there is a score and there's a choreography, but the fact that it exists sort of in these one places, the documentation is also an incredibly important part of your work. And so I'm wondering if we can, I mean, you just came off of a massive exhibition in Athens, Greece at the Neon Foundation. It's actually being performed like right now, I think. I'm getting like all these, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting all these like little bloop, bloops, like people sending me pictures. Yeah, well, I mean, that's why you're in Toronto too, is this, this, uh, quarantine from entering the US from Europe right now, which I'll be doing in two weeks for a project that I'm working on there. But you've managed to forge all of these sort of international partnerships that allow these um, exhibitions to take place in different forms with different contexts and histories that they engage with. And I'm wondering if you can walk us through the most recent one with Neon, um, the performers, but also the garments and the way, you know, how did you conceive of the movement and what was the work? Yeah, I actually, I'm just putting the link, um, I'll put in the link to the web, there's a really beautiful web page that they created that I'll, I'll can send you guys as well. But um, so pandemic, you know, <laughs> I make work that is based on bodies coming together. Critical mass is really important. Uh, big gatherings for me is really, is this idea of solidarity. In my work, I gather people to move together, to move as one body. And for me, that's the way of thinking about um, society in a more, um, a more nuanced way that we support each other. And so pandemic, I started thinking to myself, like, everything that I, I do, I can't do. I can't touch people. I can't bring people together in a room. And so I was really thinking, initially I was having a bit of a breakdown, um, you know, minor breakdown, but then I was like, okay, figure this out. New form, new form of making. 
what is the next form going to be? How do we do it? It might not be a bunch of dancers like on, in, in one space touching. How, what do we do this? And so I started to really, really think. And then I thought about the idea of a solo. And um, the piece at Neon is looking at um, um, this idea of, of, it's called a solo until we can dance again. And it's questioning the idea that, you know, I will dance by myself until we can gather. Um, and that that's and and so I built these structures, these kind of like large concrete structures that are filled with scaffolding. So they kind of seem that they're in process, they're in transition. And the dancers, um, uh, one dancer at a time, will come out and will will respond to the dance floor. So on these big monoliths, there's these these circular um, Marley's cut out. And during the day, there's a prompt against the, one of the main walls that says imagine without fear what is tomorrow so that kind of marxist ideal that the imaginary future what is tomorrow imagine without fear what is tomorrow and so the audience is asked to write a response almost like in a flexus um, a methodology to like respond and so the, the the dance floor gets graffitied it gets written on people write things um tomorrow is coming, you know, to certain, whatever comes to them, they release their, their anxiety, they release their fears, they write down on the, on the dance floor. So the dancer comes and then they start to read the dance floor and then they, they make their dance based on those, those writings, people's traumas, people's releases. And at times, like, it's interesting because they, they will use the dance floor, they'll pick it up and they'll wrap themselves around it or they'll hold it out. And it becomes almost like a protest or this burden that they're holding people's voices. And for me, you know, um, it's this, this graffiti is like, is, is power, it's agency, it's giving space. And so they have the terrain to move through these different, this, this kind of what I call a playground. Whenever I make my work, I call them playgrounds because they're sculptural installations that the dancers kind of intertwine and weave and kind of create within. So that was the piece at, um, at Neon um, um, that I just opened last week. Um, and it's still, you know, for me, it was such an important piece. And I, when, I was, when I was rehearsing and teaching the group of dancers, it was kind of weird because I was like, they'll never be together as an ensemble. Because I had 10 dancers, but I was like teaching them the choreography and there's a lot of improvisation as well, but there is choreographed motions. But I was like, oh my God, they're never gonna be together. And yeah. it felt weird, but I was like, but that's the sentiment of the piece that one dancer dances this, 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 this lonely dance and we watch it because we can't do it together. So it's a solo until we can dance again. And the writing on the dance floor comes from, you know, a lot of my work deals with the club, um, the idea of, you know, Pulse Orlando, the, the dance floor is a space of agency, the dance floor is a space of, of a safe space or a brave space. But I also think about this one dance floor in Los Angeles um, during the eighth pandemic, a dance um, um, rehearsal space called Hi um, Highways in Santa Monica. Um, had asked their community to come and write down their releases on the dance floor to, re to respond or to write the names of people that were dying of, H of AIDS. And so that became kind of like the footnote that then became my neon piece. And I've always been thinking about this, this, that dance floor, because it resonated with me so hard, you know. Um, you know, this pandemic for me definitely has residues from, you know, me coming post AIDS crisis, the AIDS crisis still exists, but like, you know, coming out, you know, in, you know, um, and no, and still having that residue of fear and, and not knowing how to maneuver or what would happen to me. So the, the two kind of have becoming like, are being intertwined in my, my thinkings. Yeah. And, and that's like the most problematic thing about the, the discourse surrounding, I mean, there's many problematic things, but the discourse surrounding the pandemic as the first um, pandemic or the first epidemic to reach our generation or from the last hundred years is is false um, with with the AIDS crisis still going on it's like how is this erasure still happening through language and language is important which I think is you know why why we work so well together as as a writer and as uh, you know with your work we are still very both invested even though I have my different research and you have your different research, the intersections that we've always found are through how are we narrating our contemporary art history? Um, what stories are we telling? How are we telling them? 
it's it's very and I think and I, I think that's really important because we continue to tell stories because sometimes the stories get forgotten right and you know uh, even like I, I taught a class on you know post uh, post um, you know pre and post and current AIDS crisis and some of my students were like I don't know what an AZT is and I'm like okay let's 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 go back we need to remember these as as you know we need to remember our histories and and, and recollect them and then and put post, you know, learn from them. So I think it's really important. And I think that's what we do in our in our work together is we we do it in ways that, you know, really challenge, but also kind of create, you know, reminders, but also newness uh, in its in the dialogue. Yeah, and the prop is also you know such an important part of your work, and it's been something that, you know, you always, there's the the dancer the the body is the artwork, but then there are also these props that are then, you know, are those sculptural objects? Are they props for a performance? Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about like, not to be crass, but like when was the first time you sold a prop? Like when did you realize that this thing is actually also a sculpture or these, these objects that are used in performance can also be objects of art within themselves. And I think I've always known that that's what they are. When it was actually once sold, I was like, oh, okay, somebody bought one. That's kind of kind yeah. of crazy. Um, and I think the first time that happened was at the after the Whitney Biennial, the whole installation was purchased. And um, I was like, and I went to a collection that I respected. So I was really kind of like, okay, but like I make devices, I call them devices. Uh, I make furniture devices that, again, like augment, challenge, burden the dancer's body, but they're also like sculptures. And so it's funny. And one of the, the first time I started thinking about them between that, that space of, you know, oscillating between one thing and another, which then I was like, oh, again, hybridity, you know, there's, they're not many things, was when I had to work at the Whitney Biennial and we had to talk about insurance claims. And that's how I started to think about them as different things, because, you know, when, when they're being danced with, they're not, they're not insured as art objects when they're, when they're, <laughs> when they're um like when this, somebody's putting their legs in a split on this thing it's, it's not an art object it's yeah. it's insured for something different and when it's when it's um when it's um just on display it's a different insurance and so then i was like oh this is really interesting but then i started thinking about like my research with naguchi and martha graham at the graham sorry, at the naguchi museum which was another show that i did um a collaboration between the naguchi museum and myself i also say it's a, a collaboration between myself martha graham and um uh, naguchi um was the idea that you know what a nice crowd to be i know <laughs> um, and I should pause it and say that my dance injury was not ballet, but it was a contraction in second position uh, in a, a grand class. So uh, Martha, <laughs> Martha came full circle back to me. But uh, the thing is that I, um, you know, was thinking about how Noguchi made props and designed sets for Martha Graham and how those now are displayed in the museum as art objects. So even within that space, that kind of like you know, duality, that multiplicity is something that's really um, interesting for me to kind of consider. Um, and so I've really been pushing that a lot in my work, because again, it creates that kind of confusion, that kind of tension that I've been talking about within my identity, within the form of my work, but also in the form of the, the objects themselves, they become classified as many different things. And I kind of like that. Right. Yeah. They're in that like liminal space where, yeah. yeah which, you know, also causes problems within the art world too, that's so uh, hell-bent on wanting to categorize everything in, in these really digestible- Well, even just thinking about like, insurance claims, right? Like yeah. how insurance claims claim the work as being an art object at certain times, and then insurance claims will tell it's a, it's a prop at different times, you know? And the dancers could only touch the, the objects when they're for that exact moment that it was deemed performance time. And when performance time was over, there's no way you can touch it. But even the way that, even the way the audience would maneuver when it was dance performance time, they created a stage and they all stood around them. And then as soon as they left, the dancers left, they then moved into the space and started to mingle around the objects and would view them like a sculpture. Yeah. And so those choreographies are really interesting for me, those kind of embedded choreographies within our everyday mm -hmm. space, how we walk, how, how we act in a museum, how we act in a theater, for example. Yeah, it takes all of the institutional cues that we all think are normal 
um, because we're used to behaving a certain way that are actually very prescriptive. Totally. Um, and learned, it's all learned behavior. Um, so the, the exhibition that you did at Noguchi, I think, which was two years ago, is really the, um, I think it laid the seeds for the upcoming performance that we're about to do in August, September, and October of this year in Chicago's Millennium Park. Um, for those that haven't been to Chicago, it's this gorgeous um, park right on the, on the Lake Michigan across from the Art Institute of Chicago where the famous bean is. Um, but we're actually behind the bean in the Lurie Garden, which is a prairie, um, a prairie preserve right in the heart of downtown Chicago uh, that was designed by landscape architect Piet Udolf and really questions this idea of what makes a native species. It's, it's a perennial garden, but as we've learned, not everything that is native is actually a native plant. It's sort of a controlled, um, it's a controlled invasion actually um, for, for the biodiversity to allow the native plants to grow. Um, they need some com healthy competition. So that was a site that we picked a few months ago and, and it just got announced by the city of Chicago that it's happening this summer which is fantastic, but the, the title of the work is called 72 Seasons and it refers to the Japanese calendar, um, which is divided into 72 seasons. So each season in the Japanese calendar lasts about five days. Um, the seasons have these really beautiful poetic titles such as fog descends or white dew collects on the, on the amaranth or, um, the first fall, uh, the first frost falls. Yeah, or like thunder quiets its voice. You know, so we have all of these relationships to nature through language um, that are happening in, in the seasons that we've chosen to host this performance in once a month um, for three months. And, but it also comes from the Four Seasons Ballet, like it references that history. So I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about how you how you came to connect those those two ideas and things? Yeah, I, well, I definitely think like you know, as a ballet dancer, the Four Seasons has always been a, a ballet that I've really been. Um, it was it was a ballet that I really enjoyed dancing, but I also really just thought about this and the notion of like you know the Four Seasons, you know, and in that narrative, it's like you know, life to like, you know, spring life and then to death winter. They kind of like very like, you know, linear kind of trajectory. And then thinking about, you know, the 72 seasons, this idea that there can be, you know, many more seasons and many more moments and the poetics of it was really, really struck me. And then thinking about the site and the specificity, but also the idea of like making dance in isolation, outdoor space is the way that we can do it then again. And so working in the garden, I've been really thinking about the process of life and beginning, but also going back to the land you know, going back to the land and giving to the land and, and tending the land and thinking about how do we, um, you know, what does it mean, again, think about this notion of new forms, what do we have to regress, change and go back to nature and then rebuild again. So, you know, we talk a lot about these processes of, of decolonizing. And for me, it's like about, you know, going back to nature, going back to the ways that are, are, are seen as analog, but they're also very generous, kind, and giving. So there's a collaboration between, you know, the uh, the body that tends the land, but also the land that gives back to the body. And so I think that was the kind of ideas that we were thinking about. And this idea of of, of life, death, growth was really important for us in this in this piece. And so we're we're doing three performances. One will be in August in during that specific season, and then we'll do one in um, September and then one in October. So it's the kind of changing landscape, the changing space. And so we'll be performing live uh, with six dancers, um, and we will also then be creating a documentation to kind of create some kind of like video that kind of collaborates and then through the magic of, of, of editing, creating like this kind of splicing of all the seasons to kind of, kind of create the kind of narrative um, feel. And uh, I should mention that like, we're working with uh, Rad Haruni, who's an amazing Canadian um, 
designer who's going to be creating like a very specific kind of costume that will look will kind of like will be, will have a kind of like a look but each season will kind of uh, have a, a, an, an accessory or something that will make it feel like part specific and and owned by that one season yeah also you know those three months in in any cold climate uh city are the ones that have undergo i think the most drastic transformation so um it is a really exciting thing to be planning and um the other thing too is is thinking about you know my role in the project and with you collaborating has been how do we bring writing and language and how does the text of the work actually get disseminated to the audience and so we've come up with a few ways and just for everyone to know you know we're still two months out from this project so we're still kind of in the active um ideas phase which is always the most fun um, because whatever we're talking about now anything can happen between now and then but we had this idea to do a catalog that's sort of um, democratic and dispersed and decentralized so that whoever is in Millennium Park and happens to see the performance, like we might have an airdrop PDF and just like airdrop bomb everybody this catalog of a choreography and a score, which will make sense to them when they see dancers in the garden, but also is a kind of jarring thing. Um, and also subscribing to this uh, text message service where um, as part of the registration to attend the performance, you would subscribe to a service it would text you information about the performance the weather conditions whatever's happening that day but also fragments of poems or written portions of the choreography and the score um, and this is the stuff that gets me excited because it's like there's more than one way to write meaningfully about a work that is not just a book or a leaflet it's like language can really expand your idea of what the work is oh and, and I, little plaques too and little plaques yeah and i think so we have all these this and again that goes back to like my work in dealing with fluxism and the idea of like having like poetics that can describe something that could be political or activist but also could could ask you to do something physically and do move you know for example and so we're having these these kind of moments in the garden and i always i'm using you know, technology, analog technologies. Like I did a whole performance this past year for the Art Gallery of Ontario, where the whole choreography was 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 created, uh, rehearsed, and then uh, performed live on Zoom. But I've done other things where I've used Snapchat and um, other forms. And so um, this idea of like this, the, the text messaging I've also done before, but I love this idea of disseminating, you, you, you sign up, but then you, at the end of it, you get a score, you get like an art piece. Um, so I think that that's really um, an interesting way of kind of thinking of dance and technology, uh, dance um, and through technology that we use every day, like our cell phones become, you know, even the way we swipe, that's a choreography. And so I kind of just love um, those, um, those, those, those moments of using um, tech to kind of get people to think differently and to also like challenge the, the, their movements or their, their, their conversations. Yeah. What was it like? I think it was, I watched this Godard film, like the most recent one, Goodbye to Language. And there's this like whole diatribe rant about how the thumb is the most important part of the body now that the phone has been invented. Oh, I need like, to watch this. It really does allow us to think about, you know, what part of our body is most important um, and how we move through space. We do have an an eventual goal to create a garden or to curate a garden, um, like a permanent public installation that is made for choreographers or with choreography in mind. But, um, you know, this whole idea of, of what it means to move in public space, I think takes on. A greater. Especially in pandemic when you can't, re when you couldn't really at the time leave your home Right. It, yeah. should have, it should have erased both of our jobs and yet we didn't we, we managed to come up with some weird thing well i think it's because that's the resilience and i think that's the ideas of like allowing ourselves to think outside you know like i was like i'm not going to stop doing this i'm going to figure this out there was a moment of like 
panic. And then I was like, okay, now we do this all over again. I never assumed I was going to make, I never imagined I was going to make a piece on Zoom, but it was totally amazing. You know, we, and I'm, and it was political and it was powerful. And, you know, and then we, we attracted, you know, 600 people on that Zoom call. And I was like, if I did it live, I never would have had 600 people because the museum probably couldn't handle 600 people. And so it was just interesting about these ways that, you know, we're challenged through a pandemic, but it also, there's also ways, there's silver linings for sure. Yeah. I'm thinking of, we did work on one pandemic project, which I actually forgot about which was related to this Zoom, um, to this Zoom performance, the power is no power flag, which we had. So I run a space called Chicago Manual Style um, out of my garage, couldn't have anybody there. So I did this project with flags called Four Flags where 35 artists in Chicago designed um, an artwork that would be flown from the top of my building. and. We had eventually, uh, we had had a dream to do a performance of a dancer on my roof. And I, I think we made the right decision in saying that's not safe. But also I think it just led us to this conversation, you know? <laughs> so it, 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 was a, it was a thing where we're like, okay, well, let's not do that. But the flag was really important. Like it was this, it, it was how I was feeling in that moment, in that time where I was like, the, you know, like I was thinking about, you know, the pandemic, but also the social uprisings of Black Lives Matters that were, were outside my window where I would put on my mask and go and protest. And, but I was like, you know, what is this power? Why, we, what is this power doing, uh, you know, for me? It's not supporting me, you know, and thinking about police abolition and all these things. And so that flag was, 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 was indicative of my space, my sentiment at that moment in time. And, um, it would have been it would have been interesting to do a performance, but we just were like, okay, well maybe not right now. And then it's led to seventy two seasons. Yeah, no, it's it's exactly right. So I just wanted to let everybody know that's in the audience right now. I'm going to ask Brendan a few more questions here, but to, if you have any questions, um, now's a good time to put them in the Q and A, and we can either unmute for you to ask or um, read them out loud. Um, but one of the things I wanted to sort of close with before Q&A, if we do have any questions, is I know that there's also, you know, quite a few students on the, um, on the attendees um, and who will be watching this on YouTube after. And I guess what I wanted to cover is sort of the, the uniqueness, but also the strength in working with an artist over multiple times over the course of many years, which I think doesn't happen so much in the contemporary art world. There is this, um, for some reason, there's this drive that if you do, if you work with more artists and do more smaller projects, like therefore you are a better curator. And one of the things I really like and the trust that we've sort of built over the years is that because we worked on the few projects and we keep working together, it is really nice to see like both of our developments over the course of, of a number of years. And, you know, we're both young chickens, so we will keep working together. But um, yeah, I guess what's your, I mean, do you have any other relationships like that that you've worked with over a long course of time, I imagine you have to because of your unique practice, which is not necessarily a gallery solo show of just two dimensional work every other year. It's it's based on networks. Yeah, and I think that that's really important. And I think, and I, I'm so grateful for that um, type of relationship that we have fostered. And I love that we we can come back to each other. Because I think there is this thing that you, you have an exhibition and then you move on and then you never do it again. And so you're one of those. And of course, also Ellen, but also like Hendrik Folkert, uh, from uh, who's currently at the Art Institute of Chicago. That's someone else who has kind of continued to to work alongside and pay attention to what I'm doing. And always like kind of come back and interject or Rujeko Hockley at the at the Whitney right now, who put me in the, her and Jane Panetta put me in the Whitney Biennial. Like, you know, we had done other research and projects and we can keep it where, you know, it becomes like not just business all the time. It becomes like also like a relationship. Like we, I'll, yeah. I'm like, I'm going through something. Like, let me, I'm trying to think this through and then I'll call you or I'll call Ellen or I'll call someone. And so I think it's really important to have those types of relationships and allyships in the art world because it can get somewhat, you know, 
lonely or like, you know, I'm in my studio by myself sometimes thinking these ideas and then I bring them to the studio and I, then I present them to my dancers. But sometimes I'm like, are these ideas good? <laughs> are they valuable? Like, you know, it's just because you are in your head. And I think that was something that was really difficult in the pandemic was like, I was alone thinking these things. And I'm like, you know, when I came up with the so a solo until we dance again, I was like, is this too sentimental? Is this me just going through something right now? But now that I see it and I've envisioned it and gone through the process, I'm like, yes, it's powerful. It's valuable. It is this. But, you know, as artists, you know, you're sometimes just in your head a lot. And so um, I think it is important to have these relationships. And again, I'm really grateful for that, Stephanie. Yeah. No, and it's, it's also nice for, um, like, this idea of expertise has kind of gone away with, with like people being an Instagram curator. And I'm like, I don't know how you can truly curate a meaningful project with an artist if you haven't continued to, um, you know, be involved in their work. So we have, we have a question in the chat here. In what ways do you think we can keep the art world diverse and inclusive? Also, how do you continuously evolve your ideas? So I, a, I think two, we have a lot of suggestions for how to keep, how to make it diverse and inclusive too. Yeah, I think it needs to be constantly self, like uh, self reflection, uh, to see who is included, who's not included, um, to be thinking about how do we like challenge the space, the institutions, um, to to um, you know, it's like that, it's that idea of decolonizing, but it's like you know, how do you bring in new voices? How do you bring in those? Um, those bodies that aren't represented. Yeah. And that's something that I do, like even within ballet, you know, I'm making a critique of the space. I'm making a critique of this, of that, of that dance form. It's something that I love and is a, is a part of me, but it is also something that I'm trying to challenge and change. And then I think for me, like, how do we, how do, what about the ideas? I think it's partially, you know, what I go through. It's my lived experience that kind of really challenges me to kind of make work, you know? I think I'm, I don't know what it's going to be, but I think living in this quarantine and, you know, being coming, coming home for the first time in two years and being like, you know, in a, in a basement lockdown, I'm in a very nice basement, but it's, yeah. um, it's, <laughs> it's still like this kind of idea of like, oh, my, I, you know, I think those ideas will resonate. I think the paranoia, of, um, um, anxiety and fear of a pandemic is something that I've been thinking about. The psychological aspects of, of, of anxiety, paranoia, and fear and fear. Um, I don't know what that's going to be, but they're, they're, they're churning, they're writing. So I guess my work also is very processed. You know, I live through things, I think through things, I read through things, and then ideas come th through me. So that's something that I really think about. Yeah. Um, and I, we don't have to, or like we can edit out this part, but I've always been personally curious before we move on to the next question. The Whitney Biennial that you were in, um, which was really a career maker, in a lot of ways, it is a career maker for most people. And it was your first biennial. It was a very contested biennial. Yes. How did you, I mean, there are pros and cons and there's also the privilege of being able to pull out of a biennial versus the privilege of the not, being not in a position of privilege to pull out from a biennial. How did you work through that political decision with other artists pulling out um, or writing letters to the board of where the museum was getting their funding for people that aren't familiar with this um, controversy. It was, you know, there was questionable board members. So the museum was accepting funds that were fueling conflict and war in other, in, in other regions of the world in a very violent way, but it's also an art museum. And for artists such as yourself that make work up, that make their living off of the commissions ha that have to happen in museums. How did you, how did you navigate that, or like what? It was complicated, and I, I, I know I think people wanted black and white answers. People wanted like either you're in or you're out. I actually think it's very gray because if you if you did pull out, then you wouldn't have had the Noguchi Museum show or been able to have your work move up to a different price point. 
at a gallery for a sale. You know, these are important factors that will allow you to continue making work. And also like, you know, many of the artists that did pull out were very like established artists who had already done biennials, had already been in the biennial before. And so the privilege was, was you know, one that, you know, kind of created, gave them more notoriety. It's like, you know, but they already had been in a biennial. So they already got that check mark. But for me, you know, I think, you know, my voice, if I take my work out of a museum and I remove it, like the politics of that board member were were ones that I don't believe in, but I said if I take my work out, I remove my my. No one's going to see what I what my politics are. No one's going to hear my voice, and so visibility for me was really important. Plus, my piece is not necessarily a static piece; it's a living piece. Um, it 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 employed twenty dancers for a six month contract, and if I pull out, that's their livelihood. So I have a responsibility in that in that way. So there was those many things that were made it very gray. And for me, you know, I don't think removing my work ever would be a political gesture. I want to make, I want to make change from within. And I kept on saying that, you know, we want to dismantle and decolonize museums, but for me to to just, it's not about breaking down the walls and 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 tearing down the museum and then building up again. I don't believe that kind of that, that structure will exist. For me, it's more of a metaphor of like we use the structure that we have, make change from within and create new doorways windows and pathways. And that for me was a very important stance that I took on in the, in the biennial. Yeah, no, I know. And it, it was such a public, it was also such a public debate. And I was the one in the public that was, the, you know, was constantly being like, Brendan stays in, so-and-so stays out. And so it became this kind of like back and forth, and, but the press wants press, you know? And so I was very much, you know, in the eyes of the press, the artists that stayed in, even though many artists did stay in, but I was the one. Like, I remember like being at brunch in New York and my phone wouldn't stop ringing. So I was just like, I was like, oh God, oh, who is calling me? And it just was people in the press, like, we want to quote, we want to quote. And I'm like, right. But it was always like, they wanted it to be very black and white. They wanted it to be as, they wanted it to be a headline and a controversy that it is actually a very gray area. Um, but I think such an important, it's such an important part of the work's integrity too. I think it definitely depends what kind of artist you are if you make the choice to stay in. For sure. The work should be judged based on the work that you chose to include. Yes. Not necessarily, um, uh, you know, a, a single thing. Anyway, we have another question, which is, would we be able to talk about our choice to move to and stay in the state? It's been complicated for us both. <laughs> We have lots of lawyer problems. And does the environment better nurture our creative careers? I, I went to school. I went for the Whitney program and I didn't, I never imagined, my family never imagined that I would stay in the States, but I just, it just kind of kept on growing and growing. And I, it was nurturing for me. Um, I felt it was rigorous. Um, I had to hustle. Uh, it taught me certain ways of being, but I always identify as a Canadian artist. I'm always very much prominently visible in Canada. And that for me is very important as well. So, um, and so, I, and, and the thing is like, we, I might be based in Chicago, but I'm never in Chicago. I think the first time I, I spent any time in Chicago was during the pandemic. And I was like, oh, this is Chicago. Like I am in and out all the time. And so Chicago is like a landing pad. Like I'm sometimes in Toronto more than I am in Chicago because I'm coming back and forth. But this with the pandemic, it was something. But I am also a professor at Northwestern University. So that's partially why I'm also in Chicago. Um, but I, for me, you know, I'm, I'm nurtured in many ways, um, you know, through a Canadian community, through an American community. But um, at, at this point, like, you know, I, I, I have reasons to be there that keep me there. Um, and, uh, and I'm, I'm just, and I have a community of people that mean so much to me that I, I and I just kind of keep staying there. I don't know if Steph, what, what's your thought on those? I mean, all of the above same, we would travel about the same amount every, every year, but pre pandemic, you know, we were lucky if we spent one to two nights in Chicago a week that I counted that as a good week. Um, I didn't like that amount of traveling, but it was a necessary amount of traveling for for how things were and for the stage of my career at that time and I'm, I'm, for yours post, post biennial too. Um, I don't think I'll ever move from Chicago though because I absolutely love it here. I mean, never say never, but um, it is the only city in the States 
um, not in the world, but in the States for me, where I feel like there's, there is um, a great community of scholars, thinkers, like-minded people, amazing artists live here. There are 14 amazing institutions. What lacks is the commercial gallery um, community, but even that's growing. Um, and we have quite a bit of people, but there's, there's no um, expectation that you have to come out every single night and socialize. If you're writing a book, it's like you write your book and everybody kind of respects that. Um, and does so it really, does it, I have to say like, you know, like living in New York for 15 years and then coming to Chicago, there was a real sense of, of community. You know, when I came to Chicago, people were like, oh, welcome to Chicago. You know, we know your work. We were excited to have you here. Um, within the first three years of, first two years of living in Chicago, I had three solo exhibitions at the, some of the main institutions. And that was like, kind of, I was like, oh, what is happening here? And it was like a very, you Happy know. in New York within three months? <laughs> no, you know, like it's still, it was like, it was like, and people, and New Yorkers are, have a mentality of like, Oh, you did it keep working you know like just you check you, just, you don't stop you don't acknowledge your labor you don't acknowledge the work you've done and chicago really gave me this moment to like think about the work you've done and, and support it um and i think for me like i i like the the, the idea that chicago is my base but i can come to toronto uh, and i can go to new york or i can go to la or i can go to europe like i just kind of like to be uh, like again like not traveling every week but having that that mobility is really important chicago is also a very affordable city I was thinking about, at one point in the pandemic, I was thinking like, I'm going to move back to Toronto. I want to come back home. Um, and I couldn't afford Toronto. No, no, no. We have a lot of, we have a lot of space, but there's also the, this, it's a working, it really is a working city in the sense that like, if you have something to contribute, it's like, do your work and people will kind of judge you based off the work, not how many parties you went to. So yeah, exactly. Perfect for me. Although we love we love a good party when it when the time is right. <laughs> <laughs> like after our seventies two seasons performance. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, I mean, well, we just talked for a whole hour. Hour. I know. I was like, we can talk for hours anytime. But... I was gonna say this is like normal for us. <laughs> is there any other questions? And I said some really nice, uh, generous uh, compliments and comments. So really oh, grateful for that. Everybody. Um, if not, I believe that this will be uh, recorded on the YouTube channel. Um, hey, Steph, do you want to put in your uh, our, our, our 72 season uh, web link? Oh, yeah, I'll do that. I put in my web page and I put up above the neon um, uh, performance in Greece. Um, and then check out our 72 season project, which is going to be beautiful. And I'm so excited. And that's all I'm thinking about right now. I know. Thank you, thank you everyone. Um, I think we get to, oh shoot, sorry. I put it to all panelists instead of, I'm technologically challenged always. Oh, did I, maybe I did it too. No, no. You're, you did it right. <laughs> okay, well, I think we'll sign, we'll sign off and say thank you to everybody. And Brendan, I'll hopefully see you in a nope. few weeks. <laughs> yes, please. Okay, thank you everyone. Take care. Bye. Be safe. Thank you, bye.